thank you so much for being with us, um, Bill. It's really an honor to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Bill, there are so many things and that we can talk about uh, from your books to your white papers um, to your work. Um, and I think it wouldn't be an overstatement to call you a living legend, um, at least in the enterprise data warehouse um, and leaders. And, um, and it's a true honor to um, have you. But let's start a little bit about um, how did you actually get into computers? I mean, you were born um, in California in 1945. Um, that must be quite some time to be um, living in um, early days of technology. Well, it's a long story, but I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, when I was going to school, uh, I took a few courses in computer programming. Now, in the day and age when I was going to school, there were no other courses to take. There was no major. There was nothing like, like what we have now. Uh, when I got out of college, uh, I, I actually tried to play uh, professional golf. And I, 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 I tried to join the PGA Tour in golfing. And, uh, uh, and I quickly found out that uh, even though I was a good golfer, I was not a great golfer. And uh, so I got tired of starving to death. And one day I looked in the paper and there was an ad in the paper about somebody wanting to have a programmer. And I thought, oh, I know how to program. So I went and got the job and uh, uh, I haven't been starving since then. So, uh, so that's uh, how I got my start, kind of an unusual way to begin. I was in a place called Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, uh, and I worked, uh, my first job uh, was for a company called Western Electric. And I'm not sure Western Electric even exists anymore. It's part of the AT&T system, but uh, uh, I, I got into programming and computers uh, uh, because I was a failure at golf. Quite interesting transition. Um from sports um, into computers. Um, and what what inspired you about computer? Because we have had um, a lot of interesting guests uh, on our podcast. Um, and one of my good friends, um, Prashant Natarajan, who's now an vice president at H2, talked about his childhood in rural India, um, where um, the word opened for him once he got connected to the internet. Um, and it inspired him to actually go out and explore and what technology can do. What was that thing? And I presume it was quite early days for the internet and connectivity. What inspired you to get into computing? Um, once I got into computing, I, uh, uh, I, 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 I think the thing that separates me from most people is I look at things differently. And, and I, I've all my life and everything I've done, I've always had a different point of view. And so when I got into computing, uh, uh, I, started, I started to see patterns. And, and, I, and I was the only one that saw these patterns. But uh, I would see these patterns, uh, patterns for business intelligence uh, and things like that. So I, I, uh, I, I learned how to program. And I, I still program today. Uh, but uh, uh, I learned how to program. And then programming led me into database design. And then database design led me into uh, database administration. And then database administration led me into architecture. And that's, that's the path that I followed. Very interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about the data in your times. And that must be markedly different from our time when we have <laughs> the data lakes. Thanks to you. I mean, you are... Um, the father figure for um, the data warehouse, but um, I presume that must not have been the case in your time. So if you had a business in 1950s or, or 60s, um, how would you gather data? Was it a simple one-page website? You received email from uh, forums, um, like the primitive websites. What was the state of the data in your time? I was in to the world of computers at the very beginning. And the world at the very beginning is unlike anything you've seen today. Uh, uh, the first language I, I learned to program in uh, was uh, machine language. And, uh, 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 and then, then we had this big advance called Fortran. Then we had COBOL. 
uh, the the uh, when I first began, uh, data was uh, uh, entered into the computer and run through something called paper tapes. I, I believe the only place paper tapes exist today is in a museum. I, I don't believe uh, that there are any, any, I've never seen a paper tape uh, in all of these years, but in the, uh, the initial day, day and age, uh, people were wiring boards uh, people were uh, uh, creating paper tapes, uh, uh, and then then we had this new invention called the uh, the, the 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 card, the Hollerith, uh, uh, uh card, and in which we would do punch holes in them, uh, and and that was a big advance. And then came uh, 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 magnetic tapes. So uh, uh, it was the the world of the beginning world is nothing like the world we see today. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not even recognizable. So how did you collect data if you were a business um, in back in those days? Um, I mean, data was not humongous as it is, um, but businesses at some point, they would need to store customer information in some form. Uh, what was the earlier computers like? Uh, if you were a business uh, owner, how would you collect data? Uh, you would collect data on punched cards, uh, uh, put them into magnetic tape files. Speaking of the early days, I, I, uh, once many years ago, I saw something that I don't believe you can see today, uh, but a long time ago, they used to have computers to where uh, you could look at, at the bits themselves. Now, the bits themselves were in a little circular ring, and, and you could look inside the computer and actually see the bits. I don't believe today, I, in fact, I'm certain today uh, that you cannot actually see the bits in the computer, but uh, on the early computers, I remember the, the early computer, the earliest computer I ever saw and paid attention to uh, was the IBM 1401. Uh, 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 and again, you can't even, uh, the, if there are any 1401s in existence, they're in museums. You, 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 nobody uses a 1401 today, but uh, uh, the, the data was stored uh, <coughs> on punched cards and uh, on punched cards and, and, uh, 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 and punched cards were better than doing everything manually. You have to understand the very early applications of the computer were alleviating people uh, from doing everything in a manual fashion. So as crude as they were, and they were crude, I, I'm the first person to tell you, yes, the early days were crude, they were still better than doing everything manually. Why would you think so that it, it's, it's, just, it's comparatively better? Well, because it was faster, it was more, it was accurate, uh, and you could handle volume better. And, and I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to uh, take a very large task and do it manually, but the amount of work, the amount of time uh, uh, is simply enormous. And once you can offload that to a computer, you let the computer do the work. And first off, the computer can do the work better uh, uh, and the computer can uh, do it much faster and much less expensively. Uh, doing manual work is, uh, is, is, is a real pain. Well, one of the arguments can be made in favor of human beings that you know, computers do not have the common sense of you know, where to put the data and what to put and you know, have contextual information. Um, and talking about that contextual information and computers becoming intelligent, at what point those punch cards started uh, digitizing themselves so that people like you can actually have enough of data to create a uh, data warehouse? Well, I think the, the, the death of the punch cards, by the way, you don't see punch cards anymore. I mean, I, th I think in the last 10 years, I may have seen one company actually still doing punch cards, but I'm going to tell you 99.9% .9 of the world doesn't use punch cards today. Uh, but uh, 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 what you found is 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 that uh, the punched cards 
but were replaced by uh, disk storage. Once we found out that we could have uh, data stored on disk and access it directly, we needed a better way to uh, 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 enter data. So uh, the first thing that happened was we had things called terminals. Now, a terminal was a very crude form of the personal computer, but, but nevertheless, with a terminal, you could actually enter data directly into the computer and store it on disk. And so uh, we went from uh, punch cards to terminals. Uh, we then went from terminals to uh, much more sophisticated terminals. We went from terminals to the personal computer. Uh, uh, we went from the personal computer to the internet, and that's pretty much the progression that was followed. It was such a fascinating journey, and you documented or started documenting this um, process um, through your first book with Arnie Barnett. Um, and you also mm -hmm. held your first um, conference. Uh, that might have been quite a task back in the times when people wouldn't understand the um, significance of your work in documenting um, this whole process. Tell us a little bit about how did the idea come about and you know, did you face um, any peer pressure around that that doesn't make sense or things like that? Well, let me tell you something. When the notion of a data warehouse first began, the vendors hated data warehouse. And, and why did they hate Data Warehouse? Uh, because first off, they didn't invent it, number one. And number two, Data Warehouse was going to, you need to put yourself in the shoes of a vendor back in that day and age. They were selling uh, hardware, software, and consulting services to people right and left. I mean, the, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a gold mine for them uh, to be able to, sell things. And when, when data warehousing came along, uh, they somehow figured out uh, that data warehousing was going to, uh, going to reduce the need in the corporation for all of the things they were selling. So the vendors, uh, uh, principally IBM and to some extent Oracle, uh, but IBM and Oracle and a few others said, oh my gosh, we we can't let this thing called data warehouse uh, get out and about. And, and uh, so the vendors had very strong economic reasons for trying to kill data warehouse. Uh, uh, I, I think it's a testament to the, 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 the power of data warehouse that data warehousing survived uh, the best attempts of IBM, Oracle, and others. And, Speaking of ironies, the irony of ironies is, is, is that, that IBM probably sold more hardware for data warehousing than, than everything. So on the one hand, they were trying to kill data warehouse. On the other hand, they were selling uh, a hardware right and left to support data warehouse. So that's a paradox that I've never really understood. I've often wondered what would have happened if, if IBM had actually understood and supported data warehousing, I wonder where IBM would be today. I think uh, that's probably um, a lesson into if you can't beat them, uh, join them. Um, and uh, one of the um, interesting um, aspects of your work is that you also were one of the first people who wrote about that in a magazine. And you were the first um, person who actually gave classes, like official classes for warehousing. How did that um, land with people who are not your normal vendors or uh, business enterprises? Um, the adaptability or reception among people and the very idea of how are data concatenates in one single place? How did that land? Well, there's kind of an interesting story uh, uh, that, 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 that that, that goes with that. And that is that uh, the people that loved Data Warehouse were from the marketing and sales organizations. If you went into the IT organization, IT uh, was told by the vendors to hate Data Warehouse. And so uh, thank goodness we had the marketing and sales people in the world uh, because they're the ones that recognize the value of Data Warehousing. And they dragged the IT people 
uh, uh, into the corporation to go do data warehousing. IT never supported data warehouse. It was marketing, sales, finance that uh, caused data warehouse to, uh, to actually uh, be, be become reality. When I first started data warehousing, doing all of those classes and seminars and whatever, for the first two or three years, uh, we had nothing but marketing and salespeople in the class. And then one, and, and at the beginning of every class, I would ask uh, how many people here are from IT? And in the first early years, no one was from IT. And then one day I started at, I, I, again, I would start the class by saying who here is from IT uh, uh, and so forth. And then one day I started to notice that more and more people from IT started to, to come in, into the room. But it was because of marketing, sales and finance and what data warehousing could do for them uh, that we even have data warehouse today. That's an interesting paradox that most useful, uh, you know, for vendors, that should have been the most useful thing, the whole concept of data warehousing and yet they were against it. But you won over the marketing and sales. Why do you think that was happening? <laughs> um, I, I, I need to be careful how I answer that question because uh, I, I, I have some, some really scary stories to tell you, uh, but uh, uh, the vendors, in particular, IBM. IBM, at one time in the world, IBM was really the only technology company in the world, and they didn't want to share that with anybody. They thought that they were the ones that told people what to do and how to do it. And for the longest time, indeed, they were. Now, this is before Microsoft. This is before Oracle uh, 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 and some of the companies we have today. But once upon a time, IBM was where all technology decisions were being made. And it's a matter of, of pride, ego, um, uh, uh, arrogance, uh, that, that IBM thought that they could determine uh, uh, what the future of technology was. Well, it turned out that uh, uh, data warehousing was not something that IBM had built. I, IBM had placed all of their hopes on some people uh, called Ted Codd uh, was one in the relational model. And, and IBM said the way of the future is uh, uh, is to, to have DB2, Ted Cod, and relational databases. That's what we need to do. The fact that, um, that data warehousing was not an IBM-sponsored uh, concept, I think it was uh, very offensive to IBM to, uh, to say that somebody else was going to have a thought that IBM didn't have. Now, today... IBM is not the powerful company that it once was. Once upon a time, if you were going to be doing technology, you were going to be doing IBM, and, and that was it. Uh, but, uh, uh, but today, that's no longer true. Uh, IBM is a, an also ran today. Uh, uh, and, and, but I, 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 uh, uh, to be truthful with you, and I need to be careful how I say this, IBM was the most arrogant company in the world, and they're paying a heavy price for the arrogance that they had. Well, I can add a lot of uh, injury to that insult because we were partners with IBM mm -hmm. um, here in Pakistan, and uh, we're no, no longer partners. And I've talked to a lot of people within IBM and outside IBM, and uh, I think they would exactly use the words that you have used, arrogant, um, ruthless, um, careless, um, and quite insulting, to be honest. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that Warren Buffett um, took his money out of um, IBM, and it's no longer um, the technology leader that is. Um, but let's move on from um, IBM roasting to a little bit of your um, consulting and um, the, the business that you took to uh, took public, uh, prison. Uh, yes. Um, and uh, where did IDA come from and um, how did it become so successful back in those times where technology wasn't the most growing market ever? Well, uh, my old days in prison solutions uh, was really a continuation of data warehousing. 
and and we we decided that uh, there needed to be uh, uh, active online monitoring of the warehouse. What what was happening was this: is that uh, these data warehouses started to grow data like like nobody had ever seen, uh, uh, and and they started to have huge amounts of data. Well, when you start to have huge amounts of data, there is a phenomenon that happens. You start to get something called dormant data. So what you wake up and find out is, is that uh, you've got all of this storage and only 10% of it is actually being used. 90% of it is, uh, is dormant. And so uh, uh, in order to, uh, and, and then the question is, okay, how do I find out what my dormant data is in my corporation? Because once you find out what your dormant data is, you can then take that data, put it off over to secondary or bulk storage uh, and save a lot of money. Uh, uh, so uh, that was the motivation behind Prison Solutions uh, was to be able to allow people to determine uh, what data was being used and what data wasn't being used. And um, uh, as far as I know, uh, the technology is still being used today, and, and quite frankly, it worked quite well. But uh, that was Prison Solutions. Now, while I was at Prison Solutions, uh, uh, the latter days of Prison Solutions, uh, one day I was sitting there wandering in my mind as it always wanders, uh, uh, asking myself the question, uh, gee, when you look at the corporation, are we really using the data we have in the corporation. And the truth is in, in almost every corporation in the world, uh, we have uh, a, a huge amount of text. Now there's a, a lot of reasons why text does not fit well with a computer. Uh, uh, and, and I could go into, there, uh, there's probably 50 reasons, a lot of reasons why, why text has never been uh, something that people have paid much attention to. And yet, in the corporation, in the day-to-day -day activities of the corporation, text makes up the vast majority of, of, of information in the corporation. So uh, many years ago, I sat down and said, okay, why is text not used and what can we do about it? And uh, uh, so that was the Prison Solutions uh, led me to the, uh, the challenge of, of being able to incorporate uh, text into our decision-making process. Now, it turns out that there is a gold mine of opportunity when it comes to, uh, to text, that uh, uh, people have lived all of these years uh, without examining text, and that's a shame. Um, uh, but in today's world, you don't have to do that. Some of the places where uh, text is found uh, that, that is very useful, that isn't being used, is number one, medical records. Uh, uh, that, that around the world, doesn't matter whether you're in India, United States, wherever you're at, uh, <coughs> medical records contain very valuable information. But medical records are written in the form of text. Now, what this means is, is that when people go to do research on medical records, they've got to manually read the record. And th that's, that's, that's a great limitation. If, <coughs> pardon me, if you can put the text on um, um, a, a computer, if you can figure out how to uh, put the text on a computer, now you can analyze millions of records but a doctor is not capable anywhere, you know, in the United States, anywhere. There's no doctor on this earth that can read and analyze manually a million records. They just, uh, it, it, the, the human brain can't handle that, but a computer can. Uh, so one place where a text is very valuable uh, uh, is in terms of medical records. Another place where text is very valuable is in hearing what we call the voice of the customer. Uh, and being able to understand what your customer is saying. Because there's text out, I don't know if you've ever looked out on the internet, but there are site after site on the internet of people that write 
information about the products and companies that uh, they uh, 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 that, that, that they've had business with. Uh, airlines. I mean, if you want to read some really sad stories, go look at what airlines have, have done. Uh, 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 but it's not just airlines. I mean, uh, manufacturers uh, uh, of products, uh, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, et cetera, and so forth. So out on the internet is a world of information about products and services. And, and uh, but it's all in the form of text. That's how people communicate. They write text. And so in order to take that information off of the internet, uh, you've got to be able to take text, read it, put it into a form that can be computerized. That's another place where uh, text is uh, uh, very valuable. Another place, interestingly enough, where text is valuable uh, is in corporate contracts. The contracts that a uh, corporation has, uh, and every corporation that I know of, uh, uh, has, has contracts. Uh, and I have asked this question to executives on many occasions. I said, how many executives here in the room understand what's in your corporate contracts? And today, not one executive has ever raised their hands. They said, uh, well, we have a general idea, but we really can't tell you what's in our contracts. And I, 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 say, I find that to be very interesting because I then say to the executive, I said, well, um, uh, uh, aren't you in charge of corporate liability? Shouldn't you know when your corporation is liable for some activity or some event or something like that? Oh yeah, we understand corporate liability. Well, don't you think there's liability in your corporate contracts? And the answer is, well, yeah, I guess there is. So how can you tell me that you are managing and understand liability when you don't understand what's in your corporate contracts? So, and, and at this point in time, the executive uh, kind of looks at the ground and shuffles his feet or her feet, and, and uh, uh, they, they don't have an answer for that because, because it, 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 it's a stupid question. Of course, people uh, have liability in contracts. But if you, and, if, and of course, if you don't understand the contract, uh, then how can you understand liability? And, and, uh, but, uh, but executives don't want to talk about that. Uh, that's a subject that is a, uh, a dirty subject and, 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 and they don't like to have uh, that weakness of theirs pointed up. So when you look at text there, and, and there are lots and lots of other places uh, where text becomes very valuable uh, in terms of information. Uh, but, but contracts, medical records, uh, the voice of the customer, those are the three most obvious places where uh, there's tremendous value in the corporation that isn't even being looked at today. And, and it, if I were a student uh, looking to start my career and wanting to have to find a gold mine, if you want to find a salt mine, go find a salt mine. But if you want to find a gold mine, go look into uh, the world of text because, because nobody's looking into it. And uh, people have said to themselves, well, the computer can't handle text. Well, I have news for you. The computer can handle text. So anyway, uh, that's a little, I, I got off uh, the subject, but that's a little bit about uh, PRISM solutions. Uh, PRISM led me to, and it really there was the question of the observation. When you look into the corporation, most of the information in the corporation is in the form of text and nobody is looking at it or doing anything with it. Um, I think that was a very well um, needed uh, primer or, or digression uh, from the topic because I have a whole um, slew of questions about um, your brilliant idea uh, about textual ETL um, and some of your um, talks and uh, white papers that you've written about that. And we're going to get to that. But I think one of the geniuses of your work is the clairvoyance um, back in the days um, to see that the textual information is worth um, gold um, in corporate um, context. 
And we're going to get to that, but uh, you coined a lot of different terms. Uh, I'm a big fan of your data warehousing and then the book data warehousing 2.0, but you coined the terms of corporate information factory. And some of the very interesting and colorful um, terms that you have coined, what is corporate um, information factory? Uh, the corporate information factory is the larger infrastructure of which data warehousing is a part that the corporate information factory includes such things as data marks, a data warehouse, uh, ETL, uh, uh, and that kind of thing. But what we found was uh, when people started to build data warehousing, uh, they discovered that they needed other things. They needed ETL. Uh, they needed uh, 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 the data marks and things like that. So to, to, in order to try to give a framework for how it should all fit together, that's where the corporate information factory came from. And when you proposed your um, ideas about data warehousing, um, the government uh, information factory, the corporate information factory, um, at the same time, um, you were also uh, creating people who were thinking just like you or were trailblazers um, who were trying to follow your path. And one of the names that appears in this whole conversation um, is Kimball. So these are the two, um, um, let's say the big giants and the data warehousing, um, you versus Kimball, if I were to put that in that way. Yep. What's, what do you think is the strongest weakness and the strength for the Kimball approach to data warehousing and how to structure the whole information um, acquisition? First off, let me state that uh, uh, I'm friends with Ralph Kimball. I've never had a bad word with him. Uh, 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 some of the things I read in the press, I'll tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of something we in the United States we have called the inquire. You, you check out your computer, you check out your, your, uh, your grocery list and they have these magazines about movie stars and, and, and they're all the time, movie stars are fighting and, 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 and having affairs with people and things like that. And, and, uh, 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 and in my heart of hearts, I don't believe that the National Enquirer is, is accurate, but I, I, I've seen, I don't know how many times people try to think of uh, Ralph Kimball and I as enemies. We're not enemies. We never have been enemies. We've never had a, a bad word uh, between us. However, uh, uh, Ralph Kimball uh, 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 supports something called data marks that, uh, uh, and, and here's what I tell people. I said, if you want to take your old legacy systems environment uh, uh, and have a quick way of getting information out of them, then you should be using a data mark. But the problem with data marks are you don't have any believability of data. The data that you're operating on may or may not be accurate data. With a data warehouse, uh, you have an architecture in which the data has been vetted. It, it, it's, it's data that is, um, uh, uh, it has, is, is corporate data. It goes from application data to corporate data. And once it's in the form of corporate data, it's very believable data. So if you want something very quick and easy from your uh, uh, applications, then the, the dimensional model data mart approach of Ralph Kimball is what you want to do. If on the other hand, you're, you're, you're concerned about the believability and accuracy of your data across the corporation, then you want to build a data warehouse. Now, having stated that, uh, uh, the data warehouse and data marts work together very well. In fact, corporation after corporation builds a data warehouse and then uses the data in the data warehouse to feed the data mart. And that is the architecture that we have evolved to. Uh, uh, on numerous occasions, I've talked with uh, uh, the Kimball people and suggested that we have a um, we have a joint effort towards uh, showing how the data mart and data warehouse work together. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, the Kimball people um, 
haven't thought that that was a good thing to do. However, architecturally, that's what we have evolved to. Well, let me state um, very honestly that I've read your work for years. I've seen um, your conversation and interactions, and all I can see is that you have been very respectful of the um, opposition and objection to your methods. You know that I can vouch for that. You know there is very good camaraderie between um, you guys, and I think objective discussion is something that pushes technology forward. Um, and one of the things that I was just playing devil's advocate here is that why is that? that a distributed system or a dimensional um, data mart system less effective than the corporate centralized um, system. I mean, we could put it that way that, you know, it depends really on organizational needs. Um, and, you know, one architecture might be better for one organization and that might not be better for um, a different site or different industry um, organization. Why do you think that um, data mart cannot deliver as much benefit um, as um, a centralized system? Well, it's because of the fact that with nothing but data marts, you don't have any data that's reliable because you can, you can have data marts are built on top of applications. There are many, many applications and applications have different data for, uh, for the same value. You've got, you've got my, my, my account balance for the bank. And if I have eight different applications in the bank, I may have eight different places where my account balance has different values. And so when you put data marks directly on top of uh, applications, the data does not have inherent believability. Now, some corporations aren't worried about that. And if that's the case, then they don't need a data warehouse. But most, most large corporations have got all of these applications with all of these different renditions of the data. And, and that's what, uh, 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 that's the problem. Again, a really nice solution is to, to take your applications, take the time and work to build a data warehouse, and then put your data marts attached to, use the data warehouse as the means for feeding your data marts uh, 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 and, and because then your data marts have believable data. If your data marts are based on nothing but applications, uh, there's the, 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 the data that they're operating on is suspect for, uh, is suspect. Let's expand the discussion um, to the core utility of data, which are the end user teams. Um, it could be um, business analyst, analysts, um, it could be um, decision makers, it could be data science teams. And when they are creating their dashboards um, or the Jupyter notebooks or further analysis, they will need quick access to the information which is clean, consistent, um, and valuable. Now, if I were to rephrase what I've understood from um, your explanation of how data marks can be useful, but after coming from a data warehouse, why is that that cleaning process or that ideal process uh, cannot be integrated after data marts. Why does it have to be after a data warehouse, um, get the clean data, then move them to different departmental data marts, and then the business teams use that information? I mean, why cannot we fix the Kimball system? What, 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 what is the necess absolute necessity of the central business warehouse? because Ralph Kimball says we don't need to do it. When you take a look at the works of Ralph Kimball, the most he ever refers to is a staging area. And in his parlance, a staging area is really a data warehouse. But uh, 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 Ralph uh, wanted immediacy of data. Take the data from the application and, and put it directly into the data mark. And that's that, uh, that in the Kimball, approach the thing, there was no uh, way for vetting the data. Uh, when we pointed that out, as, uh, as I did in several occasions, uh, um, uh, then is when they say, oh, well, we can go back in and vet the data and we can put it in the staging area. The problem is that the staging area is just another name for the data warehouse in the, in the Kimball architecture. 
Interesting. And um, that's what you've written um, in one of your white papers and there was reading um, on another aspect of data, which is the metadata, metadata the, the data about data. And um, you have some interesting words about that. Um, so it, looks, it goes like this, um, consider a symphony um, orchestra. What kind of music would be created if the violins were playing Beethoven's Fifth, the cellos were playing Hotel California, the drums were playing Aretha Franklin's Respect, the flutes were playing Happy Birthday, and the trumpets were playing Jingle Bells. The result would be a bunch of noise, nothing that anyone would want to listen to. And in that context, I think it's very interesting that um, the Kimball's architecture would fall short of um, these um, fine granular details like metadata metadata uh, what, what do you say about that Met metadata is an interesting but a, almost a separate topic and i have to say that in our industry uh, metadata from an industrial standpoint has been the most poorly done uh part of our technology it's always been an afterthought and and uh, uh the truth is is that metadata is truly very important. I mean, I mean, there's no question about it, but, but it's not obvious. And people only want to do what's obvious. So it's only after they do what's obvious uh, that they learn the importance of metadata. So metadata is, a, uh, is an orphan. And, and, and I think in today's world, with some of the technologies we're seeing out there in terms of libraries uh, uh, and so forth, uh, that uh, uh, the world is maturing. But now, now metadata has had a rugged history. Once upon a time, and I can't remember the name, uh, repository. Uh, um, and I don't mean to pick on IBM, but uh, once upon a time, IBM announced they're going to have this thing called repository and 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 ibm told everybody don't buy anything commercial um uh wait for the ibm repository the repository was where metadata was supposed to be stored and for seven years time ibm uh told everybody to not do anything because the repository is coming and then i'll never forget the day this happened uh then one day IBM announced there's not going to be a repository. And, and so that, that set metadata back at least seven years time. And uh, 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 it, there was an article that I saw in Time Magazine, IBM spent over a hundred million dollars trying to develop the repository. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and then one day, that they said, whoops, sorry, we were just joking, no more repository. So, so metadata has had <clears throat> a rugged history uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of its existence, uh, of how people wanted to treat it, of its commercial existence. Uh, uh, it's, been, it, it's, it's like a soccer ball being kicked around. Everybody gets to go kick the soccer ball. And, and the poor soccer ball uh, it doesn't like it when people are hammering on it. And, and, uh, and that's what metadata is like. So I think the world is maturing. I think that we are starting to have respect for and an understanding of the importance of metadata, but, but, but metadata has been an orphan for all of these years. And I, I think the orphan is growing up and becoming a, uh, uh, an active, full-fledged human being, uh, but it has taken the, the, the road that uh, metadata has traveled has been a rugged road. Um, we're going to get back to that, but let's take a quick break from your um, work um, to you, your personal life. And it's an amazing um, thing for me to realize that um, you have written 60 books in your lifetime. That's about one book um, per year or even um, more, you know, if you take out the first 15, 20 um, years. And I was just wondering, how do human beings 
become that productive. And I'm not even considering the articles and white papers and talks and conference presentations. I mean, do you even get some sleep or something? Well, let me let me tell you, I come from a family of authors. My sister has written 28 books. My father wrote six books. And one of the uh, people in our family tree was Edgar Allan Poe. So, uh, uh, so we, uh, we as a family are, um, and I have a niece that was a writer in Hollywood. Uh, she wrote for uh, television shows. And so I come from a long family of writers. Now, let me tell you a little story. And this, this is the gospel truth. When I was going to college, I avoided writing. I hated to write in college. And, and, and I, I majored in mathematics and computer science. And, and, and in those subjects, you don't do much writing. And, and, and so I, I, I wasn't a writer. And then one day I was in San Francisco uh, working at a company in San Francisco. And <clears throat> I got so frustrated with the way things were being run that, that I didn't know what else to do. I sat down and wrote a book. And, and I'd never written anything before in my life. And, 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 and when I took that book uh, 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 out there in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, where I was at, uh, at the time, um, there are actually a lot of publishers that were out there. And so I had this book. I'd never written anything in my life. I took it to some of the publishers, and, and I, I actually got five offers to publish the book, which is unheard of. And 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 um, uh, which is unheard of, and and so uh, uh, so then I discovered that today writing is a form of relaxation for me. I, I like nothing better than to sit down and write another book. It, it's uh, uh, some people relax playing golf, some people relax going swimming, some people relax going to the beach. I relax by writing a book. And, and, uh, uh, and when I, you know, I have to tell you, when I look back and, 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 and uh, see that I've written the books that I have, you're absolutely right, I've written that many books, but, but it's almost incredible to me. I, I, uh, 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 I didn't set out to do that. It just happened. I mean, what can I say? It, 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 it's like a man and a wife in a family. Suddenly babies come. And they just happened. They, 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 you don't know how they got, well, you kind of know how they got there, but uh, you don't know how they got there and, 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 and they just occur. Well, the books just started coming out and um, uh, one book led to another and another book led to another. And, and, and I have no idea how I wrote 60 books. One aspect could be that, you know, it, it sounds almost like a race with your own um, sibling. Um, I remember, I can't think of the name on top of my head, there was this Nobel Prize uh, winner um, guy who actually, the rivalry between him and his father was so big that his father kicked him out because he published more papers <laughs> and than he did. And, you know, it turned out that, you know, he eventually won the Nobel Prize for that. And uh, that, that's an interesting fact that you come from a uh, family of um, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I've read him quite a lot um, in high school um, for the literature. And I was just wondering, do you only write about science technology? Do you have an interest in fiction, poetry, arts, literature? Actually, uh, when I first started writing, I was in the Bay Area and I took a course at Stanford University on writing. It was an adult education course. It wasn't a, a regular Stanford course. And I, I tried my hand at writing fiction. And yes, I have written some things in fiction, but I had a professor uh, pull me aside and, and he said, uh, breaking into the fiction marketplace is very difficult to do. You ought to, to try writing first about what you know about your profession. And so that's this professor at Stanford uh, uh, steered me that direction. And, and what I found out was, this is kind of interesting, is in, in my profession, the high tech profession, uh, we have all of these smart people, we really do. We've got people that are very, very intelligent, uh, but, but they are terrible communicators. Uh, I've got several friends of mine 
who, again, very smart people, but in terms of communication, they're not good at communication. And I realized that uh, as far as a technician, I consider myself on a scale of one to 10 to be about a five. I'm not, I'm not a one or a two, but I'm not a nine or a 10. I, in terms of technology, there are people that know far more about it uh, than I do. But in terms of communication skills, I'm, I'm pretty much a 10. And so, uh, uh, so I had enough technical background to, to write things, but uh, I had enough technical background to write things. And, and so that was my, my gift in life. And, uh, and, uh, and when my first book was written, the most surprised person on earth about that first book being written was myself. I couldn't believe, because I'd never written it. I had not written a checkbook before. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, uh, so anyway, uh, it was all a mystery to me how it happened. Um, I was just wondering, uh, did, did you publish that a book uh, or whatever um, fiction that you've written? Uh, um, where, where could you re read your non-technical work? Um, I would rather not talk about that. <laughs> okay, I respect that. I have, been, I have a variety of reasons for not wanting to talk about that. The answer is yes, I have published some fiction, works of fiction, but uh, I'd rather not talk about it. And um, I guess that question was asked uh, from Carl Jung, the great psychologist, that would you rather have that published uh, posthumously? Um, yeah, I would. Okay, and you know, I'll hold someone to that promise, um, I guess. Uh, but let's talk about um, Yale. Uh, what did you study there? Um, how did that contribute to your intellectual growth, um, your good, bad, um, or worse experiences? Uh, at Yale, I, I took my first course on computers. And, uh, uh, and, you know, it's interesting. To me, when I came into computers, uh, it was, it was so natural. I, I, I didn't have to study. I didn't have to, uh, I mean, it was just all common sense. It's like, oh, of course. Uh, uh, and, and other people really struggled with it. But, uh, but programming uh, uh, and stuff was, was all, um, all, I mean, it just made sense to me. I mean, let me tell you something. My, 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 my wife is a doctor and she says the same thing happened to her when it comes to the human body, uh, 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 that, that in terms of understanding blood and the heart and the kidney and the liver, she says, oh, it, it's, it's just, it, it, you know, I just understand it. And, uh, and, and I, on the other hand, I don't understand anything about the human body. In fact, I, I can't stand blood. Blood, I faint when I see blood. My blood, your blood, anybody's blood. And, and, and so I'd never have made a doctor. But um, uh, but there are just some things in life that uh, you just have an aptitude for, and computers happen to be the thing in life that I had an aptitude for. I was just wondering, the reason that you're so good at both the technology and communication, do you think that it might have been your time at Yale, or you were just born with that? It's just like within genetics, because I see a lot of engineers that are terrible at even telling what they have done. You know, you have to really interrogate them like prisoners to know, can you explain what you're doing? Do I, do I have to do the documentation of your work? Why do you think that, you know, you stand out from that crowd? Um, it, it, it's, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I think, honest to God, uh, okay, in my life, I've had one course in my life on writing, and it was a course that I took at Yale, <clears throat> and it was a very good course, but, but, but that's the only training I ever had as a writer. I, I, I never had any professional course. Now, I took the course at Stanford uh, in the evening time, and in a way, that course at Stanford uh, was a uh, uh, really good for me because we we did something called uh, writers workshops and in a writers workshop uh, you take what you've written and you read it and share it with other writers and they critique it and I'm going to tell you in a lot of ways a writers workshop is a is a raw experience because 
You've taken the work that you have done and people tear it apart. And, and it, it, on the one hand, it hurts you to see what you've done torn apart. On the other hand, it's an incredible learning experience. And, uh, and that's what I was doing when I was at Stanford. And, and, uh, 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 and that's, I, I guess you could say that's where I really learned to write, except that I was trying to write fiction at the time. And that's when the professor said, uh, you ought to try writing um, uh, about your profession. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, 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 in terms of aptitude, and the directions that life has taken. I mean, if you'd have asked me when I was 20 years old uh, uh, and, and asked me where I was going to end up when I'm the age that I'm at now, uh, I, I would have called you a liar. I would have said, you're crazy. And I, I meant it. I, I had no idea uh, I would end up like this. It's, it's all been a happy accident. Um, let's get back to your uh, work. Um, building upon um, your um love for language and that might be the reason that you know you, your your prophetic understanding of how text would play an important role in the future um, of how we perceive communication and technology you wrote in one of your articles um, on linkedin about um, your distaste for um, elt as opposed to etl and yep. you said elt sounds good as a theory but it is woefully inadequate in practice in fact elt leads to really nasty problems what happens is that people extract data they load it into wherever it is going and then they conveniently forget to transform it they have a thousand excuses why they can't transform the data uh, don't you think that criticism is probably more on the human side than the technological um crippling um of sorts people are busy people <clears throat> they don't like <clears throat> they don't like work they don't like interruptions and and in order to do the transformation that's required there's no other way around it. Work, W-O-R-K, and 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 um, and it's complexity uh, 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 and having to do things that you don't like to do. It's it's like it's like my refrigerator. Uh, <clears throat> every every six months or I don't know, or three months or whatever like that, I have to go and clean out the refrigerator. All kinds of things have mold on them, and and I hate it. I I don't I don't like to do it. Uh, I have to force myself to go clean out my refrigerator and, and, and I do it, but, but because if I didn't do it, I'd get sick and I'd have all kinds of bad things happen. Uh, I'm forced to do it. Uh, but uh, uh, doing the transformations that are required for, uh, uh, for creating an integrated foundation of data, uh, people avoid that like cleaning out their refrigerator and, and uh, they don't want to do it. And, and why? It's complex, it's hard, uh, you make mistakes. There's all of the reasons that things people hate. And I understand why people uh, hate to do uh, the transformation work, but uh, I also reckon if they don't do the transformation work, they end up right where they're at today with a bunch of data that, and none of it to be believed in terms of, of data. One can also argue that um, that might have been a good um, criticism to level in times where we didn't have enough computing power um, or automation that uh, the transform or loading steps uh, could matter interchangeability they could come first or in, in, in or afterwards but now when we have this computing power and automation uh, it, does it really still matter Computing power has little or nothing to do with transformation. That you can have all the computing power in the world, but 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 your the 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 transformation process is going back and having to understand the meaning of data. How was this data calculated? Where was this data calculated? Uh, what data was excluded? Uh, 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 and and again, the the issue of computing power. Uh, uh, is has nothing to do with it. It's like you saying to me, my cat wants to go out uh, of my house uh, uh, and it's going to rain. Well, whether it's going to rain or not has nothing to do with whether your cat wants to leave the house or not.
<laughs> so the, uh, the, the amount of computing power that we have uh, is not an issue when it comes to transformation. Okay, uh, let's tie that into one of the things that has um, gotten us to the point that we are um, at the moment, which is the rapidity at which we're creating the data. Uh, I think one of the statistics was that the information that every four years we create, um, that's the combined sum of information that we have had throughout the history. So every four years we're um, having more data than um, the combined data in the history. And that brings us to big data. And one of the three um, pillars um, for um, having a good set of big data is the volume, velocity, and variety, as we know. And uh, Prashant was a very good friend of mine, and he wrote in the book on demystifying AI in healthcare, adds two other aspects to that, which is um, the value and veracity of the data when we analyze um, the big data. Um, how do you think the data warehouse industry has changed by the amount of data that we create now um, and the kinds of data we create now? We already have unstructured, structured, and third party, um, you know, different kinds of data that, are, that is adding to what we already have. Uh, do you think that the amount of data um, and the speed of the data that we're generating has um, affected um, the essential principles of data warehouse? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, uh, one of the features of a data warehouse is the need for uh, handling large volumes of data. And, and, and in terms of uh, 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 enhancing data warehouse, um, uh, big data has made a great, uh, a necessary need for building data warehouses of the future. However, you have to take a look at how data, big data uh, came about. When big data was introduced to the world, uh, 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 IBM and Hadoop and Cloudera all introduced data where, uh, the, the big data as a replacement for data warehouse. Uh, over and over, they said, gee, you've got big data, now you don't need a data warehouse. And that was absolutely the wrong thing to do because they didn't understand that the value of the data warehouse uh, uh, is in the ability to have transformed data. So uh, uh, I'm actually a fan of big data. I really am, but, but not the way it was positioned when it first came into the world. Now, I think the world today uh, is understanding. Uh, I mentioned earlier dormant data. Uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, corporations use a certain amount of data for their decision making, but they have all this other data that sits out there uh, that does not have a high probability of access. Uh, uh, if you take your dormant data, put it into big data, uh, big data becomes an excellent place to, uh, to store that dormant data. But uh, you've got to have an architectural perspective uh, to do all of that. And so, uh, so anyway, I, I, I think uh, big data, I, I really wish that Cloudera and IBM and Hadoop and all of those people had positioned big data properly. But IBM has been trying to uh, replace data warehouse for years and years now. And the data warehouse is still standing and IBM is shrinking as a company. I can't agree more to that. Um... Now, in 2010, um, Bill, you um, talked about um, textual ETL at the MIT Information Quality Industry Symposium. Sorry, that was 2009. And, and where you talk about the textual ETL. And that ties in with our previous conversations about how 90% of the information and the data we have today is um, unstructured data. And um, you have talked about um, that on different forums that there are about 65. Um, I really think, can think that you know, now it's more than 65 uh, al different algorithms that we can use to actually transform um, that unstructured data into something usable. Where do you stand on textual ETL? Um, you um, are planning to write about that in your upcoming book also. Um, I think um, or I think it's already pu published in November 2020. Uh, uh, where do we stand on that? And 
how would that become an important tool in the future of how we will use unstructured data? Um, that, that, sir, is a question to answer it fully and properly uh, would take a week to answer. Uh, whatever I talked about in 2009 or 2010, uh, yes, we had the idea of textual ETL, but I've learned enormous amounts since then. I'm a much smarter person than I was in 2009 and 2010. So, uh, however, the vision of the need for textual ETL remains the same. But uh, um, uh, when we first started to build textual ETL, uh, we started with something called NLP, Natural Language uh, 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 Programming. And, and what we did was we actually found every functional thing that NLP does and replicated it in textual ETL. Uh, uh, and that made for those 65 different algorithms because I'm gonna tell you there is everything you can imagine and probably a few things you couldn't imagine uh, that, 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 that take place. But what we found was, was that only a few of those things um, are, are, um, uh, are, are actually uh, really useful. Many of the things that they do in NLP processing doesn't lead anywhere. And I know for a fact. Uh, so we found out that of the 65 instruments in the orchestra, only three or four really made a difference. And, and so that's where we're at today. Now, the kinds of things, uh, uh, the other thing that we found, I'll tell you, another thing that I found was that uh, when we started to build textual ETL and textual ETL became a real viable product, uh, we went to the marketplace, we went to the technicians of the world and say, look what we can do. And the technicians of the world, just like in the early days of data warehouse, the technicians of the world ran the other way. They said, we're too busy. We don't understand why we need to do that uh, uh, and whatever. So we discovered that if you're gonna make textual ETL uh, successful, you have to uh, uh, address the users, not the technicians. And so, uh, so that's when we started to look for specific applications. The three applications that we uh, uh, identified as being important are medical records, uh, uh, um, a voice of the customer, hearing the voice of the customer, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and corporate contracts. Now, we don't pay much attention. I tell you, I used to talk to executives all the time about their corporate contracts, and, and executives don't want to hear it. They, they just don't want to hear it. So uh, uh, what we are now talking to people about uh, the end user application of text is, is, is medical records. Because let me tell you, I think, I hope everybody in the world recognizes the value of medical research. With COVID being a, a factor in all of our lives, uh, if we don't do medical research, uh, we, we may find the human population is wiped out. And so, uh, 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 so, there's no argument anywhere that medical research is, uh, uh, is something that we've got to do. We don't have a choice. We've got to do it if we're going to survive as, as a species uh, on this earth. And, and so um, uh, the fact that we can streamline, we, we can, when I say streamline, I, I can give you, let me, let me tell you, I, I ran across something the other day that shocked me. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the name of the country and the uh, organization, but there's one country in the world uh, that did a study on, I think it was diabetes, and, and, and it took them 10 years to produce something called a knowledge uh, graph. Uh, there's a form of visualization called knowledge graphing, and, and the, these people took 10 years to produce their knowledge graph. We took the same data and produce the same knowledge graph for them in one day's time. So we can reduce uh, the amount of time that, it, that and that's the difference between trying to do it manually and trying to do it with a computer <clears throat> that, that you can get a shocking amount of efficiency 
in building medical records uh, 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 when you cross that barrier. The, and what people don't recognize is the barrier that's got to be crossed is going from text to a database. Once you put that text into the form of a database, now you can do analytical things you couldn't do before. So anyway, uh, what we found was that uh, 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 doing, trying to replicate NLP and do it better in a commercial product was not what you wanted to do. You wanted to take those of those 65 <clears throat> different instruments in your orchestra, uh, you needed to take three or four of those instruments and make them uh, really efficient, really done well. And, and, and that's how you attract your end user. So anyway, uh, the, the IT people, I, I'm used to rejection by IT people. It's not anything new to me. I saw it in data warehousing. I'm seated in textual ETL, but I also know that there's a way around the IT organization. And that is to appeal directly to the end user. Show the end user what can be done, how it can be done cheaply, effectively, inexpensively, and simply. And, and once you do that, the, then the IT people will follow. But right now, the IT people, uh, uh, I have to tell you, and this is the truth, when we go to do a, a sales pitch and presentation, uh, we ask that there not be any IT people in the room. We don't, the IT people uh, have never said anything positive. Uh, they're nothing but uh, 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 an anchor on the boat and the boat is trying to win a race. So uh, we, we uh, and I don't hate IT people. I come from an IT background, but, but the IT people uh, uh, for whatever reason uh, 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 don't understand, don't understand the issues. You see, Bill, uh, this is why I think you were so ahead of your times, and in some way you still are, is that you see what's going to happen in the future. And I've read your work very thoroughly and clearly, and some of the people who have been on my podcast before, uh, they are building their work on you. Um, I've had Matthias Fay, um, who's a postdoctoral student um, at Dortmund University, who um, maintains a library called uh, PyTorch um, Graph. And what he does is that, you know, he creates this, um, based on textual data, he creates networks or graphs of how this information connects with each other. And that would have never have been possible if we didn't have a data warehouse. Um, I've talked to Uncagen at Facebook and they'll use a lot of uh, graphical um, libraries. Then we have transformers um, that are based on textual um, information. And that, I think that was the genius of the work that you were able to see that, you know, at some point um, textual information is going to bypass the very small um, relational database and information. And I was just yep. wondering, is that out of spite that people don't see that how end users are benefiting from your work or is it, um, on, does they, do they actually have any merit at all? In order to, that's a very difficult question to answer, but in order to answer that question, you need to go all the way back to 1960. What happened in 1960? What happened was the computer came on the face of this earth, uh, that prior to 1960, on a commercial basis, there were no computers. In 1960, we started to have computers. And what happened is, uh, uh, Computers found its way into the corporation, and the corporation uh, sat there and said, uh, uh, we've now got a new resource. We need somebody to manage it. Who did the corporation turn to? Well, in 1960, there was no preparation or qualification for management of the IT function. And so uh, people from accounting, people from engineering, people from uh, all sorts of uh, disciplines came in and became the management of, 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 of technology. And what happened is these people had no background whatsoever. Uh, 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 and so they depended on the vendor that they, they did what the vendor told them. Now in the 1960s, the vendor was IBM. So people 
relied on the vendor for uh, having a vision for the future. And so the, 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 the industry set the standard for where does vision come from? It comes from the vendor. And so uh, in today's world, IT people don't have vision. And it's been that way for many, many years. Now, having stated that, there are a few people that really do. And whenever I run across one of these people, I, I almost hug them like a brother because I understand that, that, that they are uh, somebody that is a visionary uh, uh, and they have an open mind. But, but IT has been trained for all of these years uh, to depend upon the vendor for the vision. And, and, and what people don't realize is the vendor is just selling a product. That, that the, the, the vendor does have a vision, but the vision of the vendor is to sell more of their product. And, 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 that's, and that's, not, that's, that's, that's not a genuine vision. Once upon a time, it was. In 1960, the world needed vendors to show the way. Uh, uh, but uh, we're not in 1960 anymore. Uh, we are, uh, we're uh, in, in 2022 right now, and the world has changed enormously, except that uh, there was this, um, um, uh, this, this, this uh, precedent set that uh, caused the, um, uh, the, the, the world of IT to say, our vision is what our vendor tells us it's going to be. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, the um, uh, IT world has gone the way it's gone. Uh, and that's why when, when we go out and talk to people about visionary products such as Textual ETL, we don't want IT people in the room. They, they, because we, I, I can't tell you how many times and, and many, I mean, the reason why we don't want people, IT people in the room is because they are disruptive, because, because they are a truly a negative force. And so uh, if we can talk to doctors, if we can talk to marketing people, uh, if we can talk to top management about contracts, uh, then we have somebody that has an open mind. But if we talk to people in IT, they are conditioned to think that uh, uh, that it, it's, it's IBM or Microsoft or Oracle or somebody is who they should be listening to. And we're not any of those. And so therefore they're not gonna listen to us. So it, it's a complex story of how all of this happened, but, but uh, and I don't hate IT, I come from IT, but I, I'm, I'm sorry to, I'll tell you what, I would not fit in IT today. I could not go back to being a programmer or uh, uh, somebody uh, like that. I mean, I, 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 it would kill my soul to, to see how IT has progressed. Yeah, I can totally see um, that, um, we, um, as someone who called things, um, you know, call spades um, a spade, uh, are, are a very rare commodity. And you have become kind of a social pariah in, in that um, sphere. And I have a lot of leaders who come on my podcast. And one of them is Avalid Saba, who has been part of um, IBM. And he is very opinionated about what we call natural language um, uh, processing. And he says that the whole term is misleading. It's natural language understanding, um, which should be language agnostic. And there should be a universal structure of language, which it isn't. So if you look at the IT and AI applications these days um, that are glorified beyond what the merit, um, what they have is uh, recommender systems um, like in Netflix and uh, sentiment analysis um, and um, other applications of that sort. And uh, unfortunately, the, the test of time does not prove that these algorithms generate end user value. And you have already talked about um, that years before in form of textual ETL. Why do you think that those um, AI solutions have not been demonstrably um, successful in, in comparison to your textual ETL? And in general, do you think data science will prevail um, over the enterprise logic at some point? 
Um, NLP is an interesting topic. Uh, NLP is designed for understanding language. And that really, that's the truth. I mean, what can I say? If you want to understand a language, NLP is great for, great for that. But NLP is not a commercial product. Uh, 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 NLP was never designed to be something to be used commercially. Uh, uh, and so the organizations that we deal with that try to use NLP uh, get bogged down in this, this horrible complexity of, of, of language, of NLP, and whatever. And, 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 and that's great if you want to study the language. But if you want to use language commercially, that's not great. That's not what you need to be doing. You need something that's easy, fast, inexpensive, and simple. That's what you need. And, and so uh, uh, NLP is nothing of those things. NLP is not simple. It is not uh, fast. It is not inexpensive. Uh, uh, and so, uh, 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 and again, I'm not, I'm not castigating, I'm not saying negative things about NLP, uh, but it, 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 it's like a, a race between a Porsche and an elephant. Now, who's going to win that race? And the answer is the Porsche is going to beat the elephant every time. Why? Because the elephant was never designed to uh, uh, to do what a Porsche does. Uh, on the other hand, a Porsche can't do a lot of things an elephant can do. And, and, and so they're two different things. And people that try to use NLP as a commercial tool or language are, are trying to use an elephant to win a race with a Porsche. They're not, it, it wasn't designed to be a race car. And that, that's the problem with NLP. What do you think of uh, OpenAI's GPT-3 models? And they have blown it um, out of proportions um, in glorifying what it can do and cannot do. At least in my experience, I don't think that it delivers the end user value. But have you had an experience of playing with it? Um, no, I've not had experience. But, le but let me tell you a little thing that we've been saying for years. How can you tell when a vendor is lying? And the answer is when their lips are moving. That's how you can tell when a vendor is lying. And, and vendors in our profession, all vendors, every one of them, uh, 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 overstates the worth and value and business value that they bring. Th that, that's a tradition in our profession. We're not going to change that. And so every vendor overstates what their product can do. And, and, and it, it's been that way from 1960 to today. And, and, and it's not going to change. And so the fact that somebody is out there overstating uh, what they can do doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, I'd be surprised if they didn't do that. So, uh, uh, but I'm not familiar with that particular technology, so I can't really say anything about it. Um, let's take a quick break again from your work and uh your opinions and experiences about some of the events that happened during your lifetime since you were an early um, adopter of technology and a promoter of technology. What do you think happened with um, the dot-com bubble in the 90s? Um, <laughs> talk about overhyping. Are, are you familiar with the, the Gartner hype curve? Is that something that it rings a bell with you, but Gartner Group I've read a lot about Gartner, but not that one. I'm not okay. Gartner has something called the hype curve, and the hype and and, and you should go look at it. It's very it's very interesting reading. And Gartner has done the world a service by introducing the notion of a hype curve. But the hype curve says that, and it applies to our industry that people uh, uh, in our industry overhype something before it ever gets to the marketplace. Then it gets to the marketplace and then reality sets in. And if there ever were anything that was overhyped, it would be the dot-com bust, or the, the, the not bust, the, the dot-com experience. There's an interesting book that uh, you should read 
uh, uh, and I can't think of the name of it now, but I'll tell you about it. It's a true story about two students at Cornell University whose father worked in Wall Street. And just for fun, uh, they invented a company. The company had no product, it had no customers, but it was gonna be building websites. And, and they got a $300 million capitalization on Wall Street, no product, no customers, uh, nothing except that the words were gonna build a, a website. And that's a true story, by the way. I mean, oh, I say that, I've read it in a book and I assume the book is, is accurate, uh, but uh, uh, that's the level of hype that there was. Uh, the level of hype was enormous. And then the reality set in, the reality always sets in one way or the other, uh, reality sets in and, and reality set in. And um, 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 the, so the dot-com uh, world boom was something that was grossly over overhyped. Uh, take a look at the uh, uh, Gartner uh, uh, hype curve uh, and, and by the way, I think everybody in our industry should be familiar with the Gartner hype curve because uh, 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 again, Gartner has done a really, really good job uh, of uh, uh, creating the hype curve, showing what it is, uh, showing how uh, uh, our industry has um, uh, uh, advanced and, and, and the hype curve explains exactly what happened in the world of dot-com. The vendors kept kept saying, "Well, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and whatever," and 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 everybody bought into it. I tell you what, it's like it's like the Theranos experience and Elizabeth Holmes. Um, uh, Elizabeth Holmes had a good idea. She 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 really did. She had a really good idea. The problem is that she couldn't make the idea work. And the second problem was that uh, apparently, and I wasn't a jury or a juror on her trial, uh, but apparently she. Uh, uh, she would lie about um, 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 her uh, uh, the, the 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 efficacy the, the the ability of her technology to work and 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 by the way in Sil I, I lived in Silicon Valley for eleven years in Silicon Valley uh, in, and I'm not defending Elizabeth Holmes uh, but but that's a way of life that 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 that. Um, uh, uh, vendors out there in Silicon Valley, almost every one of them uh, comes along and, and tells you not about the product today, but about what the product's going to be tomorrow. And they talk about it as if it was in existence, when in fact it isn't in existence at all. And so anyway, uh, 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 that's the way Silicon Valley operates. And the, the amazing thing is a lot of good things come out of Silicon Valley. Uh, it's even more amazing that anything comes out of Silicon Valley, uh, given the, um, uh, the reality of how things operate out there. It's very interesting you, you talk about that, that you know, Elizabeth Holmes did a good idea and now she's facing 20 years in um, prison. Do you think a lot of that, um, you know, when you know you're on the wrong, um, road and a wrong path. You don't want to take a U-turn because there are a lot of other people who are backing you, um, like venture capitalists and the people that you have taken money from, and that makes you uh, defend the lies that you have been telling um, other people. Because '90s, as we talked about, dot-com bubble, you were succeeding at what you were doing with Prism Solutions. That was about the same time, but you know you did pretty well in comparison to other people. Do you think that we still have that dot com bubble mentality where venture capitalists are funding everything that they can think of um, that might sound like it's going to succeed? Oh, absolutely. I, I want to tell you something right now. I worked for 10 years of my life with venture capitalists, uh, and I'm not going to name the, the corporations that I worked with, but they're the very biggest venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Venture capitalists. <laughs> And I need to be careful how I say this. Venture capitalists are not smart people. They're rich people. Now, our world has this notion that if somebody gets to be rich, they must be smart. And, 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 and I, mean, I mean, we say, gee, he, he's rich. He must be a smart person. 
boy, the venture capitalists out there, they've got money, there's no question about it, but they're a bunch of sheep. The, the, their lemmings is what they are. Uh, and, and you can imagine the lemmings jumping over the cliff and, and, and they follow the crowd. And so uh, venture capitalists are some of the least informed people uh, uh, I've ever met. And I, I know a lot of them personally. And, and uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, don't get me started on venture capitalists because I, I have stories that, that I don't want, I, I'm not going to tell publicly. Uh, uh, I've got some awful stories about venture capitalists. I make friends with a lot of people. I'm a very friendly person. I worked for 10 years time in Silicon Valley with venture capitalists. And when I walked away, I had one friend. I had one person I'd even let in my house today. And, and I'll tell you his name. He's a great guy named Floyd Kwame. Uh, he was head of somebody called Kleiner Perkins. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know who Kleiner Perkins is. Boy, I uh, do. Kle okay. Kleiner Perkins, a, a little fact, and it's been a while since I've dealt with Kleiner Perkins, but uh, they had a larger market cap than Bank of America, IBM, and Ford Motor Company put together. Uh, uh, it's a wonder that Kleiner Perkins doesn't uh, uh, own the world. But um, uh, um, I had one person that was, I considered a friend and I could talk to. His name is Floyd Kwame, and he was the head of Kleiner Perkins. And he, he was a good friend and still is today, although it's been a long time since I've seen Floyd. Uh, but every other venture capitalist was, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to say the words that I want to say. Oh, I totally get it. You know, people are going to fill in the blanks. <laughs> um, let's get back to an emerging, um, or let's say, proposed um, data architecture. Um, a lot of people um, think that that's going to be something. A lot of people think that's just an, an oversell. Um, have you heard about data mesh? Yes, I've heard about data mesh. I'm not an expert in it. I'm, I'm not. I, yes, I've heard about it. I've read a little bit about it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, data mesh solves the problem of uh, access to data. And, and if what you're looking for is access to data, then data mesh is very good for that. Data mesh, as far as I can tell, does not solve the problems of veracity of data. That just because you can access data doesn't mean that it's believable data. As far as I can tell, uh, the ideal technology for data mess is the Excel spreadsheet, where anybody can come along, create the spreadsheet, and then share it with somebody else. So that, that gives people access to data, and that's good. That's not bad. That's a good thing. But the problem with the spreadsheet is I can put a salary of a million dollars a month uh, uh, into the spreadsheet for Bill Inman. Well, reality is I don't make a million dollars a month, uh, but, but I can put anything I want into a spreadsheet. So, uh, and, and again, I'm not an expert in data mesh and, and uh, um, uh, I'm probably talking about something that I should be doing more research on. Uh, but as far as I can tell, data mesh is, uh, it's another attempt I mentioned earlier that people go for what's obvious. What's obvious? Well, access to data is obvious. You've got to be able to access data. But accessing data is not the only problem. There's also the veracity of the data. So just because you can access data doesn't mean that the data is believable, reliable, uh, uh, useful for, uh, uh, for um, uh, making decisions on. So, uh, but, but again, I, I want to emphasize, I'm not, and don't pretend to be an expert in data mesh. Um, well, let's talk about um, something that um, I personally have gone through um, in the server rooms. We come from um, um, an, an evolution of uh, Techno technological capabilities where we I have seen server rooms with huge hard disk um, and wires and total chaos um, from a time when we have Kubernetes and Docker's um, and cross-platform solutions, multi-point clouds. How do you see uh, this ease of access um, and 
cross-platform solutions contribute to the newer problems that data warehouse um, is going to be facing in the future? What's next for data warehouse? Um, I think the world is just now discovering that they can put text into a data warehouse. Now, I'm probably the only person in the world that thinks that, but I think that uh, the future of data warehousing lies in the ability to incorporate text into a data warehouse. Um, the people that think that uh, going to the cloud uh, with a data warehouse, let me, let me ask you, when it going to the cloud, what happens when you have a big mess and you put the big mess on the cloud? What do you end up with? You end up with a big mess. Uh, going to the cloud does not solve the problem of veracity of data, uh, of reliability, and and uh, um, uh, uh, and 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 going to the cloud is another um, uh, way. Another um, we have a, a, a an American expression uh, um, of what I'm trying to think of it right now. Uh, uh, we, I don't think going to the cloud is not a panacea. People think it's a panacea, but it's not a panacea because if you have a big mess and then put your big mess on the cloud, guess what? You've got a big mess on the cloud. You haven't solved your problem. So people, um, this whole notion of integrating data, of creating corporate data is not solved by going to the cloud or, or any such thing as that but that's how the cloud is being sold. So anyway, uh, uh, that's, that's some thoughts in that direction. I think we might not be uh, talking about the same thing there so because going to cloud um, for storage region is one aspect of that. And you yep. could process your information faster through distributed computing. And that might be the other face of that. So if you're going to cloud for having that distributed computing powers, that, do you think that's a better use of cloud than to actually have that mass stored um, in the cloud storage? Certainly storage is an issue. There's no question that storage is an issue, but, but, but is it the issue? It's not the issue. Uh, uh, going to the cloud with, uh, uh, for storage is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, but again, if you have data that's all messed up and unusable and put it on, on the cloud in storage, so what? You still got data that's unusable and, and, and going to the cloud does not solve the problem of veracity uh, of data, integrity of data. And so, uh, yes, there is legitimate reason for going to the cloud for uh, storage volumes of data and things like that, but it doesn't address the issue of uh, uh, what data should I be looking at and what data can I believe? Bill, you addressed um, the AI summit um, held by Databricks and, and Databricks has emerged as uh, one of the finest companies that I know at least um, in providing uh, streamlined services for a lot of um, industries that they have um, um, collaborated with. And I was just wondering, and that might be a uh, very divisive questions there. So which company do you think you would vote for? Is it Snowflake for you or, or is it data break and why? Okay. I have nothing but good things to say about Databricks. They are one of the best companies I've ever worked with. I like the people at Databricks. I like their philosophies. I like the, the their approachability. Uh, uh, and again, I couldn't say enough good things about Databricks. I, I think from an architectural standpoint, uh, Databricks uh, uh, is a much better architecture than Snowflake. Snowflake is selling the, 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 um, uh, selling the medicine that uh, if you go to the cloud, your problems are solved. And that's not true. If you go to the cloud, you've got a problem, you go to the cloud, you still have a problem. And so uh, if I had to choose one or the other companies for the future, I would certainly choose Databricks. Let's um, you know, go a little bit granular into why would you make that word. Um, so if you were to expand um, 
the comparison between a Databricks and the Snowflake into the capabilities of cloud data platform, uh, the data ownership, data structure, um, the use case versatility, scalability, and security. Why do you think um, that Snowflake lacks in what Databricks uh, uh, is offering? Databricks has a legitimate architectural approach to taking the data and putting to where it can be used. Snowflake has the approach of just putting the data on the cloud and your problems are solved. And that's not true uh, that, that uh, uh, it may be popular. It, it may be something the venture capitalists are supporting, but it's simply not true. Uh, uh, whereas Databricks is willing Databricks is willing to get their hands dirty. The, the Databricks is willing to get in there and wallow in the mud uh, to, to take your data and put it into a form that's useful. And Snowflake doesn't want to uh, uh, get in there and wallow in the mud. They want to be clean. And, and unfortunately, in order to take all the data uh, and do what you need to do to put it into necessity, you've got to go wallow in the mud. And so uh, uh, Snowflake doesn't want to do that. Yeah, I think I'm personally a huge fan of Matai Zara's work and Ali Goetz's um, work. They're very competent people, you know, the whole group at Stanford, you know, I've um, had um, the opportunity to interact with them and uh, read their documentation. And hands down, I think um, they're doing a great job um, um, and, you know, exponentially better than Snowflake. Um, so I would totally, you know, agree with you uh, what um, you <clears throat> are saying there. Um, a little bit about uh, into your thought process of how do you uh, write and read and analyze um, different things. So what books do you read um, as a leader uh, or let's say what podcasts or what people you follow that uh, gives you admiration or you're just an original thinker, which I'm sure that you are, you know, there, there's a, sometimes there is no precedent of that uh, uh, excellence. And I personally feel that you are that um, one of the million people um, that you think, but just wondering uh, where do you get your inspiration from? <laughs> uh, what I'm gonna tell you may surprise you, but I don't read books. Uh, a, a long time ago, uh, there used to be a guy named James Martin uh, uh, and James Martin wrote books. And I found that when I read James Martin books that it was leading me a direction I did not want to go. I didn't think James Martin really understood. In fact, do you remember James Martin at all? No, I don't, unfortunately. Okay. Once upon a, once upon a time, James Martin was the intellectual thought leader uh, 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 really of IBM. He didn't work for IBM, but, but uh, uh, IBM followed what he said. And, and he wrote, uh, you can look him up, he wrote a lot of books on technology as well. But, but he, took, he, he, took, he took a technician's approach. I pride myself on taking a business person's approach. And so I found that when I read James Martin's books, that it influenced me in a negative fashion. So uh, uh, I don't read books. Now, having stated that, my, 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 my wife is an avid reader. She reads books all the time. And occasionally uh, I read one of her books. I think the latest book of hers that I read, uh, let me think was uh, uh, on, um, oh gosh, gosh, I can't. And I just read it the other day. Uh, she likes to read autobiographies and she was reading about Mahatma Gandhi uh, that's one that I, I read, uh, but she was reading about, um, uh, oh, I can see his face right now. Uh, uh, oh, what was that guy's? Oh, oh Humphrey Bogart. Uh, she, 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 she wanted to read all about the, the life and times of Humphrey Bogart. Uh, uh, and, and certainly Humphrey Bogart and Mahatma Gandhi don't have much, if anything, to do with, uh, with technology. So. Uh, you ask what books I've read. I read a book or portion of a book uh, by Humphrey Bogart. I read a book about Mahatma Gandhi, but that's only because my wife had the books and uh, 
uh, and and I read them. But uh, uh, in terms of technology, uh, uh, I don't I don't remember the last time I read a book on technology. I it it may have been it may have been forty years ago. I mean, I don't read books on te- about books on technology. It, it, it's such an enigma talking to you. You have a, such a unique personality, you know, failed golfer, um, a failed fiction writer <laughs> into a very <laughs> successful business warehouse um, writer who doesn't read books. Um, um, and I was very curious about the word. And I'm just wondering, uh, beyond your reading and writing um, and golf, uh, do you also travel also? Have you had a chance to travel around the world, interacting with uh, different people. Do you have insights and inklings into different kinds of people, how word works? Well, uh, I've, I've been to 59 different countries in the world. And, and, and 58 of those were on the behalf of Data Warehouse. When Data Warehouse was just starting, I used to get phone calls all the time. And I've been all over Europe. I've been over Africa. I've been South America. Australia, uh, uh, Asia, uh, uh, India. Uh, uh, I've been to 59 different countries. And, uh, 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 and, <laughs> and I, I'll tell you one cultural experience I had that was kind of interesting. I was talking in Japan one day and the Japanese collectively have a different way of doing things. When you talk to a conference in Japan, they never ask a question. But when you walk out into the hallway, they line up to ask questions. And, and there's a reason for that, because culturally, uh, there's an old saying that uh, when a person mows the grass, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the blade that stands out is the first to get cut. And so the Japanese in a group of people, uh, almost impossible to get questions out of them. Uh, but when, uh, when you interact on a private basis, you get all kinds of questions, but that's a cultural thing. And that's what they're raised to think is right. And, and that's how they do things. And that's, that's just the way it is. The other audience that is the opposite of the Japanese is the Australian uh, audience. Uh, people in Australia are the most open, uh, forthright. Uh, I mean, you, you, you talk at a conference in Australia, and you get smothered with questions. And so uh, the Australians in that regard are the opposite of the Japanese. So um, um, the, where else have I been? Well, I've been in a lot of places, but uh, from a cultural standpoint, uh, uh, and the other place, um, uh, I was in uh, Singapore. And in, in, in Singapore, uh, they, they, uh, they're, they're very much like the uh, the Japanese. And uh, uh, the only thing I remember about Singapore, other than my experiences, was they have a fruit there. Uh, gosh, I can't think of the name of that fruit right now. Uh, but it's the fruit that that has a horrible smell, but tastes wonderful. And, and, uh, and it's the most amazing thing. Um, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. But uh, uh, somebody from Singapore will immediately know what, what the name of that fruit would be. Anyway, uh, yes, I've been to a lot of cultures. Uh, uh, one, one place that's really surprising uh, to me that, uh, uh, that has got very advanced thinking, and I really respect the people, and this is probably going to surprise you, is Mexico. Uh, uh, the, the people in Mexico, from, a, from an open-minded uh, architectural standpoint, are some of the most enlightened people in the world. I really... Uh, I've been to Mexico many times, and and the Mexicans that I've talked with uh, have been very enlightened people. But and and that most people don't think of Mexico in that regard, but that's the truth. Yeah, I think um, I, I can totally relate to your experience about this Eastern and Western um, dichotomy, probably about. I'm asking questions. Um, so in the grass that stands out um, kind of gets cut off uh, pretty quick um, in Indian culture as well. You know, you're not supposed to ask a lot of questions. And then I had the privilege to study in Scandinavia where, you know, you get to ask questions and they would be very offended if you don't ask the question. I guess uh, one of the reasons that um, people do progress um, in their intellect um, and uh, 
intelligence is by asking questions and playing devil's advocate on each other's um, yep. idea. Um, Bill, you now live in Colorado, um, very different from a place where you um, grew up um, in the middle of Rockies, a lot of things, um, nature. Um, and I was just wondering uh, what brought you there? Colorado is a beautiful place. Uh, the only time Colorado is not comfortable is in the months of December, January, and February, because it gets to be very cold in Colorado during those months. But the rest of the year, Colorado is like living in heaven. Uh, it's inexpensive to live here. We have the mountains, we have hiking, we have skiing, uh, we have fishing, uh, we have uh, uh, weather. The summer times in Colorado are wonderful. And, and the, anyway, I love Colorado and, and I wouldn't live anywhere else. Uh, so it's a, a good place to raise children. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it, I say inexpensive. Recently, the Colorado uh, 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 homes in Denver have gone up in price, but you can still go outside of Denver uh, uh, and have a very reasonable price for a home in, in, in Colorado. So anyway, uh, yeah, I'll, I'm sure I'm going to die in Colorado. The, the, that's, that's a, uh, uh, that that's where I'm going to die because I, I I'm here for life. It's a wonderful place. Um, Bill, um, I think inspiring is um, a very small um, and misrepresentative word for what I have had um, with you in this small conversation. What a life! Um, so many experiences. Um, you're such a source of wisdom um, and knowledge, um, and someone who can share it with passion um, and credibility and um, honesty. Thank you so much uh, for being um, on the show. Um, I would always cherish this as one of my best conversations. And thank you again for being on the show. Thank you, Minhaj. It's been my pleasure.